Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to our fourth installment of the Westmead Research Hub Commercialization Seminar Series. Uh, today, the seminar you'll hear is titled Developing a Medical, Re uh, Medical Device Lessons Learned from a Thriving Startup Company. And we are very fortunate to have Richard Sokolov present, to, to present today. And so uh, a little bit about Richard. Richard is currently the Executive Director of Entrepreneurship, Design and Product Realization at IDE Group. This has been a 20 year adventure and counting, starting as a mechanical engineer, then going on to found co-found IDE Group, as well as the ASX listed Atomo Diagnostics. Richard loves making a difference by working with others to build new and meaningful futures through the realization of new products and businesses. Richard has worked continuously in product development and commercialization globally. He has led teams in startups to launch and grow new businesses, as well as within large multinationals, helping them create disruptive products to fuel their growth. Believing in what is possible, applying the hard earned knowledge of how to deliver and combining it with the grit needed to push through the tough times to achieve a better future is what makes the adventure worthwhile. So um, needless to say, I think Richard knows what he's talking about. This is going to be a great webinar. Um, so I will hand over to Richard for today's webinar um, very shortly. Uh, before we do, uh, quick housekeeping. So uh, there's a Q&A function in Teams. Um, please feel free to put your, uh, please feel free to put your questions through that Q&A um, and we will, uh, you know, um, push them live. Um, Richard might answer some of them during his webinar. He might uh, answer some of them um, at the end. Uh, but yeah, please engage with Richard. Ask any questions you have um, while, while you've got Richard here. Um, <coughs> without further ado, I will pass on to Richard. Great. OK, thank you. So hopefully everyone can see that. Um, yeah, it's a pleasure. Thanks to James and to David for giving me the opportunity to speak to everyone today. Um, it'd be great if we were face to face, but obviously a um, bit of crazy times. So we'll have to make do with me speaking to a screen, um, but please feel free to ask any questions through the portal. Um, and I'll try to answer them uh, either during the presentation to break it up a little bit or at the end. Um, so yeah, I'll probably just get straight into it. Um, I think let me just change the slide. There we go. So I guess just to do a background about what we do at IDE and what IDE is all about. And essentially it is what you see in the screen. It's about building better futures. It's something that really drives us. And and we do this by creating and, and growing new organizations. Um, this is really what's at the center of why we created um, IDE almost 18 years ago now. So we, we see ourselves as an entrepreneurial partner and, and the way that we create those better futures is by you know trying to de discover develop and, and deliver on um, meaningful products and services into the market and, and by creating better futures we want that not just for the, the patients that the products that we develop um, help and, 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 and cure and treat and diagnose but also creating you know career pathways for for people in these organizations to find work that is meaningful to them and give them their own a better future. So it's a sort of multi sort of um, dimensional thing that we're trying to do, but it's all around creating a better future for, for, for people. Um, we started 18 years ago, myself and my, my, my best friend from school, my business partner, um, because we, we saw a gap that, that people weren't really um, filling in terms of helping people commercialize their technology. And uh, 18 years later, we're we're in three locations around the world. There's 65 of us doing all the sort of things that um, you need to get done to uh, get a startup into the market and, and get it thriving. You know, we like to sort of say, call ourselves a sort of a bolt-on startup, someone that you can partner with to, to take that journey. And, and for some of you, that journey is sort of in its infancy. Um, and so when thinking about you and from speaking with James and, and David, um, they basically explained to me that, you know, uh, I'm talking to a, a collection of researchers and, and clinicians or clinical researchers, however uh, we want to classify that, 
uh, and you potentially have an idea or working on some therapy or, or, or a new device and you're considering doing a startup or commercializing or translating it, which is fantastic. It's what we're all about and we love to see and support these communities. That's why we're here today trying to share uh, our knowledge with you. Um, and when asked to do this, I was thinking, well, what would I want to know if I were in your shoes? And really that's been sort of the, the framework or the frame that I've used to sort of put together today's content. And so there's about four key sort of um, things I want to convey to you and, and, I'll, and I'll sort of show you how that sort of manifests itself in a number of startups that we've worked with uh, through our 17 years and 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 to sort of convey that message and, and the impact of, of knowing that um, can hopefully help you in your journey wherever it may lead you. Um, so I'll just get to the first bit of advice uh, that, I, that I would want to know if I was in your shoes. and. And the first thing really that it's essential in this journey that, that you may want to take is to understand whether you are actually addressing a problem. And if you are, if you've got a solution to a problem, how compelling is your solution? Simple questions, um, but it's quite interesting how often people don't um, consider that in, the, in their startup journey, especially in med tech or, or health technology, you know, you can really find yourself focusing on the technology or therapy that you're trying to provide because uh, for a lot of you, I imagine you're in the sort of the, the market, you're in the sort of context where the problem is manifesting itself and what you're working on seems to be a solution uh, to a problem worth solving. But at times you can obscure the real problem by just focusing on what you are developing. So it's important to step back and try to understand the problem and understand it deeply. Um, in my time uh, working in commercialization, I've never really come across um, something we couldn't solve. Really where the problems come is not actually understanding what we're trying to achieve and, and what is the value that we're trying to bring. That's really sort of the key in my experience, uh, differentiator between success and, and failure is, is, is not understanding that because solutions I find can always um, uh, can always be uh, achieved, even if sometimes you're not achieving your ideal solution, you achieve something worthwhile or you address some part of the problem, um, not all the whole problem, and you can achieve success that way. But if you if you focus on a solution where there is no real problem or opportunity, I use problem opportunity sort of jointly, but I'm going to stick to the word problem today because sometimes value comes from things that you don't know are available. So there's an opportunity sort of uh, a perspective you can take rather than just focusing on a problem, but not understanding that problem or opportunity is where the real risk comes and, and spending your time and money and resources on solving something or developing something that is really not going to be of enough value to warrant a, a successful startup or to support a successful startup. The interesting thing though between the problem and the solution is that there is a paradox between the two. Um, you know, in an ideal scenario, you start with a problem and that problem informs the solution, then the solution is is valuable and, and away you go. But normally, normally what you'll find is um, as you develop a solution and as you should test it out there in the market or on the bench or in the lab, um, in trials, you'll learn more about the problem and then that will influence and, and affect the solution. So it's, so it's this virtuous cycle that happens and that's exactly what drives iter iterative development in commercialization innovation. So that's a good thing. Uh, and it doesn't matter where you really start, because even if you're focusing on a solution, you've got some sort of idea of the problem in your head, even if you haven't written it down or expressed it. But it's important to understand what I said before is that no matter where you start, you have to focus on trying to understand what is the actual problem that you're solving. Um, and that really also comes about with regards to whom you, for whom you're solving the problem. So it's a lot of times a successful startup is not about solving the problem just for the patient. I think ultimately, in, obviously in, in medical technology or, or health technology, the patient is core to what we do, but the problem that you're trying to solve can be um, for different people in the, in, in the context of the, of, the, of the treatment or the, or the issue that you're trying to, to, to address. So medtech is very unique in this regard. There's lots of stakeholders 
that come to play to provide treatment to a patient. There's the doctors, there's the patient themselves, there are family members, you know, if you're treating people at home or there are there are uh, other clinicians or nurses in, in the whole customer journey or the patient journey. There are payers and insurance companies, there are regulators, there is the government, there's the local health districts that you're all probably familiar with. And each one of these stakeholders influence um, what, what you would do in terms of getting a product to market and that will influence the success of where that product will get to market. So it's important when you're thinking about taking a journey and developing a startup that you understand for whom you're solving a problem and who are the key stakeholders um, that you have to satisfy. Um, so sometimes the, the most important person can be the manufacturer and, and that's where the problem lies to be able to deliver a certain therapy that you want to the market. So that's important to understand as well. Um, and it's also important to sort of translate that problem into uh, into a, into a way that you can understand what would actually be successful because you can address problems in many different ways um, but actually understanding what would result in a successful outcome really comes down to understand the needs of those key people that you're trying to solve the problem for um, you know you might have heard it before you know understand the needs or or, or or the user needs or the stakeholder needs that's really critical for success because that's how you measure whether you're hitting the the right spot and that comes through engaging with the stakeholders and, and essentially um, development and, and innovation is a people focused thing, even though people like to talk a lot, a lot about technology and science, which obviously is, is, is key to providing some of the value, understanding the people um, that you're actually affecting is, 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 is what's most important. Um, and also you need to remember that you, you're never alone. There's always competition and sometimes people think of competition as the competitor coming out with another device or what's on the horizon or what you've seen in other IP coming online or or something like that. But sometimes the competition is just what the incumbent process is or the way people do things now. So there's always some alternate way um, uh, to, to, to solve a problem or to provide someone with value that, that you're seeking to, 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 to provide. So it's important to be aware of that and work out what's unique about what you're doing that is that is uh, that is going to be compelling for someone to leave that that way of doing it or that thing that they're buying and select your way of doing it or or what you're offering in, uh, um, in competition to that. So so that's something that that sort of um, you need to understand. And how and how do you make sure that something's compelling? Well, it needs to have basically what I call three the three legs of the of the stool. It needs to be desirable, viable, and feasible. Um, without addressing each one of those adequately, you really are going to struggle to pr produce something compelling. So you may provide a treatment that is fantastically effective, but astronomically expensive and 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 not able to be funded. Um, likewise, you may provide something that's fantastic for the patient, but the clinician uh, can't adopt it for whatever reason. Um, you may not be able to manufacture it um, in the right volumes or for reliably enough uh, and, and so on. So there's 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 really there's those three key pillars of a good uh, product that uh, must be maintained if you're going to make it compelling and, and your needs basically are should be should be developed for each one of those areas. So that's just a little bit of a <clears throat> sort of uh, a basic sort of uh, some principles I'd like to convey to you um, as one of the sort of key things that I would want to know if I was in your shoes. Um, looking to some sort of part of a case study um, to sort of, sort of reinforce that that sort of message that I just gave is I want to talk to you a little bit about a company called NanoX. Um, so NanoX um, was a company that was came out of Sydney University through uh, research done um, in the physics school of physics there by Professor Paul Keel and 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 some other of his colleagues. And basically, they saw a need for um, radiotherapy. Uh, and radiotherapy around the world or the supply of radi radiotherapy units around the world was not adequate, meaning that people, especially in low resource countries, were not able to access um, these treatments for cancer um, that we could in, in, in the West or the more developed countries. And that's mainly came about because the linear accelerators, like you see on the right there, are quite expensive. Um, they're based on lying a patient, um, and I'm sure a lot of you on the call today may know about this, but lying a patient um, in a prone position and rotating the linear accelerator around the patient and basically irradiating cancer cells within the patient um, to, 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 to treat the, the, the tumour. 
Um, so they basically saw that as a, as, a, as a problem and they went about trying to solve it. And they had a great idea for a smarter, smaller cancer radiotherapy system. And so this is <clears throat> what NanoX was sort of founded on. Um, the key premise here that they were trying to, um, the, the, the sort of the solution that they were trying to provide here to that problem was that by making it smaller and smarter, you could actually reduce the size of the bunker and reduce the co cost of the actual device itself. Um, linear accelerators are bulky. They have to rotate the whole gantry around the patient, which is complex and, and expensive. Uh, because you do that, you have to shield the whole room from the x-rays being emitted, and that builds up costs in terms of the bunker, the equipment, and everything like that. NanoX wanted to change that, and the whole solution was basically don't rotate the equipment, rotate the patient, and keep them in a stable position where you could then hit them with the, with the irradiating beam. And that's what you see in that picture there. The concept was to lay the person prone, use some straps, use some inflatable airbags to hold them comfortably in position and then rotate them around a vertically positioned in the accelerator. The other part of that was to then use, um, and this was a, a large part of the work that was done by, this, by, by Paul and his team, was to actually um, be able to image real time um, as the patient was rotating around uh, this, this device and then reconstitute the image and then adjust the targeting of the beam because as your organs moved around you can obviously imagine you don't want to be hitting good tissue so you had to sort of adjust where your beam was going um, and that was done through a collimator um, which is normally used in Linux but that was the core principle make it smaller make it smarter because you could you could you could rotate the patient and you could see where the organs were moving and then you could adjust the beam to suit and that would reduce the cost reduce the size and you'd be able to get more um, uh, of this this equipment out there in the market and and address that 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 need which is uh, which was a need on on sort of the the, the health systems around low resource countries, um, and and so we actually worked with them on that. You can see there on the right we actually built a system and that system that picture there is from the Prince of Wales Hospital in the Maruba bunker. Um, and it's still being used today for research and continuing. Um, to examine uh, some of the um, technology that I just described that they were developing. Um, but as we were developing this, um, it started to become apparent that although um, it was offering um, some solutions to some problems, how compelling it was, was, was being questioned. There were a lot of challenges appearing um, with this type of configuration of solution um, that were going to be very difficult to, to overcome. So, for example, um, patients, would they tolerate being uh, compressed into that unit? I've been in it, um, I've been rotated around. Um, some patients patients would struggle with claustrophobia and struggle with the feeling of being restrained by, by airbags. Um, the accuracy, so when we speak about the clinicians, so um, the accuracy was potentially something that they may not be, be, be Put a lot of trust into because they were worried about and if any of you are in cancer treatment you're worried about margins and where you hit the when you hit the cancer have you got all the cancer and so this was a question that was coming up about the the, the basically the real-time imaging and being able to adjust the collimator could we actually provide the accuracy that needed and even if we did a lot of times the the the, the clinicians are very risk averse and so they will actually increase the margins of what they're treating, so it's not so that the, the the benefit of the accuracy may be not as apparent or not as um, compelling as we thought. Um, the workflow was very different. So, in this workflow compared to the current way that it's done, um, basically patients just lie down; they're not strapped in, and they just um, and and the beam is, is is rotated around them. Whereas here, you'd have to strap them in, you have to inflate the airbags, and then you have to rotate them around. So there was a number of issues around the desirability of the solution. That was that was problematic. Um, you know, patient rotation was definitely possible, um, but as we rotated, we thought obviously that things would move around. Even though you could restrain the patient inside your your body, the organs would move, and gravity played a big effect, and and they would be shifting. So there was that was causing some potential issues with how well we could um, target and adjust. And another fact, which was probably um, 
undercovered a little bit late was the way that the actual workflow works in terms of treating cancer patients. So there's a planning, scanning, and then there's the actual treatment. Um, and those two events happen at different times. They don't happen on the same day. And when you're the current way that people were scanning was on the lying prone and 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 still in CT scanners and you get scanned and then basically you have to then adjust that scan because as you're moving around on this type of device where you think the markers were for your cancer has now moved so how would that work so there was these these issues that that were problematic and so as we started to develop this we we, we applied for New South Wales health grant funding we got awarded I think it was over two million dollars to continue the development uh, we started to challenge some of these preconceptions and try to understand the problem a little bit better so the problem in terms of the costs and the accessibility were still there, but we were looking at some of the other problems with regards to workflow, with regards to planning and treatment. Um, and when we started to analyze that, we pivoted. And basically we understood that potentially not doing it, rotating the patient was still the right thing to do, but not doing it in the horizontal plane, but doing it in a vertical plane. Um, and, and this is where um, the, the, the solution and the company has evolved to. So Nano X became Leo Cancer Care, and with Leo, we developed what you see down there on the left was the, the, the uh, a vertical patient uh, rotation system. And this is now um, something that they've commercialized. They've relocated to the UK and they've just released their first and sold their first version or installed the first version for use with a proton um, a proton treatment system. They're even much larger than, than the X-ray based systems that I just showed. And you can see there on the right, some of the images um, and the way that this works is pretty simply there's, there's the, the patient still rotates, they sit still, they don't need to be strapped in, they don't need to be held down. Um, the, it's a fixed beam system, so basically you move the patient as the beam hits the target. And what this has also been combined with is uh, with the technology of another company that Leo is part of, which is, which is Astro, uh, Astro, I'm not sure the final name, I think it's Astro Cancer Care, um, might be wrong there, uh, which is basically a movable pivotable scanning system. So basically they can plan in the vertical plane, as you can see in the bottom corner, and they can also treat in the vertical plane. So this is a much more compelling value proposition. This uh, takes away a lot of the issues that we were fighting with. Um, and so you know, so you can continue going down that horizontal path, and there is still some value in that in other areas, but um, but the bigger, the, the understanding the solution, the problem better, led us to actually working and, and pivoting to a different solution, but still uh, maintaining and improving on a lot of the benefits. <clears throat> so just moving on to the next point um, that I'd like to share with you, I think it's important to understand that uh, as clinicians and researchers, you focus a lot on the product, the treatment, um, the therapy that you're trying to provide, but your solution that you provide to a market as a startup is not just a product, it's the business. And without that, um, it's hard to get any sort of outcome that you seek in terms of um, getting the therapy out there or, 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 or launching something successful. You need to think of it as a business. And I think that's also something that's often missed um, when people start to go around, uh, go think about taking on a, or starting a startup. They think about their product, they think about the technology, and they're not thinking about how that technology needs to make it to the market. And that's really done through the business. And the best way to, uh, or a simple way to envisage a business is through a business model canvas. This is developed by a strategizer, a company in Europe. It's, it's ubiquitous people, and you've probably seen it by now as well. Um, but it's a really good way to understand um, or to conceptualize the business. And you can sort of see in the canvas there in the middle, there's a little gift box, that's the product. So the product is inextricably linked with the business and the business model and the business and the business model is all about how you get that product to your customers so the business model really describes how you can create and then deliver that value and then capture the value through revenue and returns commercial returns um, to the organization to make it worthwhile continuing to do that and therefore continuing to provide that benefit to the industry and to patients um, so anything that you do in terms of developing product has to make commercial sense you have to be able to make a return otherwise like i said it's hard to to continue providing the benefit to the market unless you know there's an NGO that gets involved or the government gets involved which is usually not uh, very sustainable or and, and, and not very scalable um, um, and regardless of whether you want to develop the company that sells it ultimately or whether you want to develop some technology and license it 
you have to think about someone has to do that for it to be licensed, for it to be um, make hit the market. Someone has to understand um, it from a business perspective and has to develop the business around it. And developing the business around it is pretty much the same way as you go about developing the actual physical product um, or, um, or, or treatment. You, you experiment, you, you learn about what's important and then you try to develop different parts of your business of your business model to 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 meet those needs. So the business model canvas there's got it breaks into nine simple parts. There's you know things that you have to develop about how you want to um, deliver product to your to your customers through the channel. How you know what key partners you need as part of delivering or creating and building and manufacturing and delivering your product. What activities you have to do as a business. You know what costs do you incur in running the business, not just the cost of the product itself. You know how you got how much you're going to charge, how you're going to make those um, uh, transactions. Um, you know how you're going to relate to your customers, how do they want to be engaged, and all those aspects have to be considered as well as uh, the product itself. And so the desirability, viability, feasibility aspect of a product extends to the business model as well, um, and that's important to understand. And and this understanding this and working on this alongside your 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 product is imperative if you want to get funding. Um, People are unlikely going to fund something that they can't understand how it how it will translate into a business, how it will translate into a return. Again, whether you're going to be the person who takes it that far or not, that's sort of irrelevant. Someone has to do that thinking to convince others to invest. And we'll talk a little bit about investment at the end. And I think the next uh, session of your of your program you know, next week or whenever it is, is is also about investing. So it's probably a good segue to that. Um, so that's very important to understand. And we experienced this in our in our own history with Atomo Diagnostics. Um, so the story of Atomo Diagnostics really starts uh, with the other co-founder of Atomo Diagnostics, who's a CEO now, and their personal experience with a family member who had severe uh, medical issues and was in hospital for a very very long time, for many many months. And during that many many months, I uh, had to be uh, continually uh, had blood continually drawn for running. Um, tests, um, uh, hematology assays and things like this. And he thought there had to be a better way. There's a lot of trauma in that. It was a young person and um, he wanted to try to find a better way. Um, and that was really the initial start of, of Atomo Diagnostics back in 2009, 2010. And when he approached us and the approach to us was about, hey, why don't we try to make blood collection better? Um, you know, and to avoid all those problems that I just talked about with regards to the trauma caused by continually trying to get venous access and drawing blood. Um, and we, we, we believed in that, we bought into that, and that's why we co-founded the company with him. Um, and the whole premise was based around what you see up there was the, 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 the finger pricks and taking capillary blood samples and using those to do tests and, and, and run assays. And uh, part of the problem there was that although it was convenient for for the patient, it wasn't you know drawing a, a blood from a vein. You didn't need a phlebotomist. Um, the sample size was very small. It was very difficult to get good samples out of it, and it could only be used for limited sort of um, analysis. So we thought we could do that better. And below there was one of the first prototypes that we built for the device that we considered in terms of collecting more blood, um, keeping the more blood preserved until it got to the lab. Uh, and we were hoping that that would actually allow it to replace a lot of the testing done through drawing blood from a, from a vein. Um, so it was definitely uh, desirable for the patient, but we started to understand um, when we started to probe, and the way we probed this is we actually went and met with the stakeholders. So we met with pathologists, we met with people that supplied equipment to the pathology companies, we met with clinicians. We, we, we read up on, on, on lots of different reports on, on, on how um, blood testing was done. We looked at other devices used in the testing of, of blood samples and, and we built up an understanding. And what we started to understand was that we're going, we're hitting a bit of a dead end, not because we couldn't produce the product and we couldn't make it work um, and that people didn't want it and we could probably sell it for, for, for a good price, but there were other parts of the business model that weren't stacking up. For one, really, uh, it was not something that the pathology supply chain, especially in Australia and in most advanced countries, was set up to do. Um, they were based uh, on different uh, um, sample collection uh, processes, one being the vein, the other being the, the Western blot paper that you see above. Um, and, and, and basically this was, would, would be very disruptive to them. Um, existing manufacturers who produced equipment for them, um, 
were not really geared around trying to deal with something that that we were thinking about producing. And so um, we were starting to understand that there was a lot large uh, and entrenched stakeholders in this supply chain. It was not going to be easy for us to get pathology partners on board to support this or to adopt this. Um, and also, you know, it wasn't going to be able to be used for all the array of testing that that um, that was usually necessary or, or possible through uh, venous draw. And so people who were uh, would if would use this instead of getting a venous draw would have to be more selective about what they what they do the testing for, which was not really something that was part of the workflow at that time. Um, and we'd have to modify, uh, make large modifications to existing processes. So it wasn't stacking up. We really hit a dead end here. I remember the day that we we're up in Brisbane and um, we went to see one of the manufacturers um, who was building some equipment for part of the pathology process that was actually punching out those cards. And we realized on the way back at the train station that you know it wasn't going to fly and 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 so we're at a bit of a dead end there. Um, it wasn't a business model that we could pursue. We didn't have enough resources to make the changes, even though we believed in the solution. Um, so we had to find another way um, to make a successful startup fly. And really in our immersion, as I explained and trying to understand blood collection, we came across a report from PATH um, on HIV testing in Africa. And so HIV in Africa is still a very, very large problem. A, a huge proportion over a quarter of the population of South Africa are HIV positive. And the way that they try to get on top of that, um, that um, uh, pandemic is uh is to is to use what you see there on the right which is very basic lateral flow point of care testing and we in the path report basically what it said is that of one uh one out of every three africans who test using one of these kits who test um, um negative are actually positive so that's a huge problem uh, when you imagine the, the the rates of HIV infection in not just South Africa but sub-Saharan sub Africa and elsewhere in developing countries. And so we saw this as an opportunity um, and something that we could deliver on. And it, it and it was not too dissimilar to to sort of where we were looking in the first place in terms of blood collection. So what we ended up developing was and uh, the world's first sort of integrated all-in-one. Um, uh, point of care rapid test. Um, the previous slide I sort of showed, you sort of showed those all those components that came in a kit and and referred to it as bits in a box. And that's where the errors were happening. People didn't know how to use those those bits in the right order, in the right place. So people were putting blood where they should be putting buffer. They were putting buffer where they should be putting blood. They weren't getting enough blood out. Um, they weren't reading the results correctly and they weren't waiting long enough to get the results. So we went about solving that by putting it all in one and making it very intuitive and easy to use. And when we looked at the business model for that, um, it was very clear that it was a lot more, uh, it was a, it made for a better value proposition or a better business proposition than we had in the first instance. Um, you know, it was desirable for all stakeholders in the chain. So um, for people at the point of care, um, for, for the people supplying tests, it was attractive. Um, we could have multiple types of customers. It wasn't just sort of just the clinics. Um, it was, wasn't was just for one disease state. It was for multiple different applications. Um, we had the technology. It wasn't it was uh, something that we could have enough resources to deliver on, um, deliver our first product on. We, we simplified the manufacturing logistics. We could price it competitively. We could get access to tests. Um, and it was attractive to to test manufacturers because they were that was an, that was a, a a customer for us. So it actually gave us multiple business models. One was actually selling it to people who produced the actual test strips, and one was actually selling complete devices to the point of care. So that became very flexible and very attractive. Um, and we could develop all elements of the technology. There wasn't anything brand new about the technology. There wasn't anything that we had to do large changes to. We just had to apply it in a different way to uh, achieve the value that we're seeking to achieve and solve the problems that we're trying to pro solve. And that's been very successful. Um, we, Time of Diagnostics is now, as of last year, was listed on the ASX. We started this journey with that first product back in 2009, 2010. Um, and so it's been a, about a 10 year journey to where we are now. Um, the company is growing. It has a range of products all based around uh, the same sort of premise of making 
point of care testing much more uh, much easier, uh, much more accessible, uh, and much more accurate just through the improved usability, which is something that people had overlooked. And it was interesting because they overlooked this a lot because every other competitor was focused on making their tests more and more accurate. So they were going for tests that were like 99.98% accurate to 99.99% accurate, which really wasn't the problem. Um, the problem was that people could not use these tests, even though they were cheap and could be easily distributed and, um, and easily accessed. They weren't using them well, and so the benefits of them was not being realised. That 99.9% .9 benefit in the lab was not being realised on the ground, especially in sub-Saharan Africa. Also now, obviously, you can probably um, get an appreciation for how much more valuable these type of products are now, given our current situation with the pandemic. So it's important to understand that you know it's not just the product, it's the business model. That's something you need to think about from the beginning. You need to evolve, evolve this from, uh, develop this sorry, from the beginning and consider all these nine aspects or as many of them as you can um, to make sure that what you're producing is not just a compelling product, but it's a compelling value proposition. Because without that, getting the support you need to develop your product and commercialize it through investment and through support is going to be very difficult. Um, and it's something that I think you can people can lose sight of. Um, the other concept I wanted to talk about here was um, about building value and, and value and risk. So these are sort of um, two sides of the same coin, so to speak, um, but they're two very important aspects to consider if you're going down um, the route of, of doing a startup. Um, and what do I mean by that? Well, what you don't have at the beginning is 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 money usually, um, and that's usually what you need. It's a, it's a resource that every startup needs uh, quite a bit of, and so you're going to need invest, investment. Um, and product development, creating a new future, creating something brand new, means that you're not going to really get the value of it until it sort of realizes it hit the market, which is in the future. It's a future value. And so because there's a lot of time between where you are now and where that might happen, there's a lot of risk. It may not happen. And, and so you really need to think about how you to create value in the present, or what we call present value. Um, and, and, and present value is really dependent on confidence. So you really need to build confidence in those people you need support from and investment from. Um, um, to basically understand that, that yes, that, that future value is, is possible and, and, it, and it can be achieved. And to do that, you need to remove risk and uncertainty. Um, and when you remove these risks and uncertainty, you build assets. So what do I mean by that? Well, as you start to learn, as you start to develop your concept, you build knowledge, you build IP, you, as you start to test your, 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 your concept with, uh, with customers, you may get endorsement, you may have you may do clinical trials, and you know as the time goes on, you get regulatory improvement. And each one of those uh, those assets is a form of present value that that gives some sort of confidence that a future value can be realised. And that's how you have to think about it. You have to always be thinking about whatever I'm doing now is it adding value, uh, uh, or is it reducing risk? Um, because if it's not, then should you be doing should you be working on that? At times, and, and, and you know, I've been in that boat as well. You focus on things that are not so important because um, it's of interest or, or it's easy to solve. Uh, really, what you need to point yourself out is what's important and what's difficult, and doing that first. Because startups are resource constrained by nature, um, you know, you don't have enough of what you need, um, so you need to use it wisely, and that really needs to be focused on things that. Basically, can can, can uh, that you need to de-risk or that can kill the uh, the the project. Um, uh, so you need to focus on that. And the goal is actually to kill the project if you can. If you can't, then obviously you're onto a good thing. So so it's it's, it's sort of a little bit of a, a paradox there where you basically you're trying to reduce risk, but you're also trying to challenge and and trying to kill your idea because basically by doing that you learn and you pivot and you adjust, and, and then you get to something that's more valuable and more likely to be successful. Okay. And we had to go through this um, on one of our very, uh, probably one of the biggest projects we did early in our in our history as IDE, um, and that was with regards to a project we did with a company called um, Uni Life. It was a, it was an Australian company, uh, and working directly with them uh, and Sanofi Ventus, which is one of the largest farmers in the world. Um, and and this project was all about uh, needle stick injuries. So needle stick injuries, and I, I, I guess for you in the audience who are who are clinicians, obviously are aware of this. 
it can be a big problem. And um, in the United States, uh, at some point, they mandated that anything introduced into hospitals, um, um, I think in the public sector at least, that had to have some sort of what they called Sharps injury prevention feature. And what that meant for large pharma companies like Sanofi Ventus, that if they want to sell their pre-filled syringes, which is a huge part of the business, they, they sell and make uh, hundreds and hundreds of millions of, of pre-filled syringes a year, they had to provide this feature. And on the right at the bottom there, you can sort of see some of the features that they were putting around their glass pre-filled syringes. Once they come out of the big filling line that you see above, they would snap these uh, components onto it. And that was a real big headache for them. Um, it caused them a lot of problems. It caused them a lot of uh, uh, problems in, in production. So you can imagine having these enormous sort of aseptic filling machines like you see above, filling their valuable drug into these pre syringes and then having some simple bits of plastic stopping the whole production line. They weren't too happy about that. Um, and so they wanted to find another way. And Unilife at the time had a pre-filled, uh, sorry, had a had developed a, a, a disposable syringe which had an integrated safety system. And they basically reached out to 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 them um, and asked them could they do the same for 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 their for their product and their problem. They wanted to get rid of these safety features because it was posing a risk to the manufacturing process. And Unilife said yes and and, and contacted us and, and asked us if we could help. And we got involved and we tried to provide a solution to to this problem. And 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 um, it was a it was a quite a quite an interesting journey, quite a long journey. Um, and so we. Wanted, we, we had a concept, um, we, we knew uh, sort of very early on how we could do this and on the left is one of the very first images of, of the solution that we, we were thinking of, but that wasn't enough for them to support us. That wasn't enough for them to invest. Uh, pharma companies, um, when we talk about present value, future value, they're very risk averse about what the future value is and they want to know, they want a lot of upfront present value or a lot of de-risking to happen before they would come in and support the project. Um, and so we had to prove to them that it was feasible, but at scale. So the real issue here was not, the hardest thing was not necessarily the design itself, although there were quite some challenges there, or the product itself, or knowing that there was a problem out there. We knew there was a problem, we knew there was a desire for this because the customer was coming directly to us and asking us for this. What was really difficult and what we had to focus on from the very beginning was how are we going to manufacture this at scale and how are we going to prove this to them? Uh, and the only way you manufacture these is in these massive multi-billion dollar plants. Um, um, so how are we going to show that it's possible within that? So what we did is we we spent a lot of time obviously doing engineering and development around the device itself, but we spent equally amount, as amount of time around the actual process. And we developed what you see below um, is a basically a simulation of what happens in those big manufacturing plants. So we built a little automatic robotic cell to basically produce the, the prototypes and there was the large amount of prototypes, um, um, large amount of prototypes in, in, in that they wanted to get before they would give us money. Um, and so we, we, we built an automation system and we also built a lot of capital tooling and equipment to build thousands and thousands of, of prototypes for them to test before they would even consider um, supporting us. So by going through this process, we could show them that it was feasible, that we could make it to a level at a volume at a speed that was not that was going to be compatible with what they were doing in the big multi-billion dollar production plans and this is where a lot of our effort went into uh, because this is what they were not going to take a risk on um, and the result was basically uh, uh, what we have there on the right which is the world's first um, integrated pre syringe with a safety mechanism integrated i should say um, it was called the, the Unifil um, syringe. Um, it was designed to be seamlessly integrated with those large production lines. It was designed to be produced at over 400 million units per year with a less than 2% failure rate. Um, and we achieved that. Uh, and um, what that resulted in was a couple of years after we started, we started in about end of 2006, um, that uh, Unilife and Sanofi Ventus signed the biggest uh, then the biggest Australian medical device licensing deal it was approximately $40 million and it was struck between um, a couple of different um, aspects of, of the deal. One was about um, further development and one was about industrialization or scaling up. Uh, and that was a huge success. Um, New Life went on to a couple of years later, even list on the NASDAQ. Um, they were valued at approximately, I think it was at that time, over 250 or 300 million US dollars. Don't quote me on that, but it was something that in that range. 
Um, and it was um, uh, the company grew very, very fast. Subsequently, due to other decisions that they made, they, they no longer exist uh, and their IP is with other people. But um, that was at the time uh, a, a very big success for us and for them. Um, and it was obviously got garnered a lot of attention also in the media. So it's just important to understand that that um, if you're going to get investment, this is obviously one very simple case study or about the point that I'm trying to make is that you need to really tackle the risks that matter because without that, um, uh, you, it's going to be hard to get the investment and the support that you need. And those risks that matter can be in the product, can be in the business, uh, in the business model, can be in, in, in any aspect. Um, depending on the context, depending on your problem, depending on what solution you're providing, um, it's going to be unique to those the, to that context, I should say. And you need to really think about it. You need to challenge uh, challenge all aspects of your business model and of your product, uh, and to sort of see where those risks are, what what are the gaps that you need to plug, and, and then and try to attack that. Um, I mean, we could talk a lot about <laughs> how to go about that, but that's essentially sort of the the principle or the, the thought process that you need to keep in your mind as you go as you go ahead and, and try to take on a, a, a startup or, or, or start a startup, I should say. Okay, um, there's no question so far, so I guess I'll continue. Um, or have I got that wrong? Let me just see. Oh, yeah, there are yeah. some questions. There yeah, are some questions. Yeah, questions, yeah. yeah, so, yeah definitely. Uh, the, how about we fire away the first question here? So, uh, hi Richard, I'm a clinician. If I have an idea for a device that would help me in the clinic, but don't know where to begin to design it or engineer it, what's your advice? Who should I approach to help you with the idea? Okay, so you have an idea for a device. So, okay, don't know where to begin to design it. Well, obviously, I'm um, trying to reach out to people like us or, or people who who do the develop or engineers who who have developed the devices is a good starting point. Um, you'd be surprised that you know, um, just having a talk uh, with them, um, you can start to sort of put meat to the bones of your idea. So they're the sort of people that I try to seek out. Um, they can be in your network. Um, they can be professional organisations like ourselves. Um, they may be people within the within the, within the hospital that can help you. I mean, I know there's technical people, biomedical engineers around that that, that deal with equipment as well that, that can help you also conceptualise and start to understand um, how to how to put that together. But you know, but please reach out to you know people uh, like ourselves, people like other engineers or designers. Um, uh, that that are within your network or within universities. Also, you can you can do that, um, and they're more than helpful, more, more than more than happy to help you most of the time. Great, thank you. We we've got another question here mm -hmm. that I'll fire at you um, while while I've got you. Yep. But once yep. you've translated a product, how do you convince payers to order it? Other than a sales team. How have you seen new companies engage their stakeholder community once a product is market ready? Yeah, I think that, I think that the, the the premise there is that you do the work and then you um, engage your customers. That's not usually how successful startups work. It's usually you're engaging from the very beginning, so you're speaking with them. So right now, for example, and, and one thing I'm not talking about in today's talk, but we're developing a, a new device. Uh, for implanting into the eye and treating uh, with AMD. Um, and basically we're from day one speaking to potential customers, uh, trying to understand what their problems are, showing them some of our ideas, validating whether what we've got is valuable, whether they want to buy it, um, speaking to other key opinion leaders or other companies involved in that treatment space or in, that, in, in products to treat those diseases and getting their feedback uh, and, and that's what we call sort of stakeholder validation. So that happens from the very beginning if you're doing it well. Um, and then that usually helps guide you in terms of what the product should be, but also how you should sell it. And, 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 and also through that process, you'll start to attract people, for example, like distributors or manufacturers um, um, and customers who may want to buy it along the way. So that's sort of the process that you go through. It happens from day one. Um, and it happens through engaging that that those stakeholders. That it's one of the first slides I talked about today. Understanding that network and starting to talk with them and engaging with them. It's as simple as that. Uh, sometimes it doesn't take more than that, but just reaching out and starting to have the conversations with them uh, and starting to understand their problems, starting to share your solutions, 
and then that sort of builds its momentum and, and the connections build. And if there is support, if there is value, if you are creating value, then people will engage and you'll be able to then um, understand um, and get that product to market and, and sell it. Thanks, Richard. That's great. Oh, we have one more question, but we'll save it to the end. So please feel free to yeah. continue your presentation. Yeah. I've got just probably one more point, which is also good timing. I think it should finish just on time, first time in my life, which is good. <laughs> um, it's this bit. So we talked a lot about sort of principles of of development and and, and you know business models and devices and 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 you know testing and and, and the technology and, and all sorts of things. But we're not, what we haven't talked about is you and the people doing it. And I think one thing is for sure is that it's not easy. Um, I say that with a smile, but it is true. Um, and the important thing is that you're not alone. You can't do it alone. So, you know, um, it's not something that um, is possible to do alone um, and it is tough, but it's definitely worth it. I think the, the satisfaction you get through um, through doing something like this uh, one way or another is something that um, is, is hard to describe. Uh, you have to experience it, but it is worth it um, when you when you do create something new and you do see people benefit from it, not just the, the patients, but you do see companies spring up, you see jobs being created, you see people having meaningful careers. It is it is wonderfully rewarding, even though it, you can want to feel like this at times. <laughs> this is exactly what it feels like. I saw this this week. I thought I'd grab it. I don't know where it comes from, um, but that's exactly sort of the roller coaster of feelings that you experience when you're doing a startup. Um, there's a lot of insecurity at times that comes into it. There's a lot of bravado at times, um, um, and sometimes um, there's a bit, there's a lot of luck that comes into it as well. Um, but it's important to understand that you, you know failure is powerful. Of course, hopefully you've seen through those brief snapshots into some of those case studies that I shared with you that failure is powerful. Of course, it's part of being successful, and it's this it's this purpose and 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 and, and having this enthusiasm to keep going. That's that's the most important. Uh, most of, if not all, the entrepreneurs and friends that I have that are doing similar things. Uh, one thing that they say is they enjoy the process. They love the process. Um, they love getting involved in doing this, and 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 they have an enthusiasm for creating something new. And that's very important to understand that it's the process of creating it and continuing that that is also a measure of success, not just um, the end goal. And usually, those people who are successful in startups are not focused. Uh, so much on the end goal or there being an end, but they continually um, continuing through the process. And once they get a product to market, continuing to develop that and, and moving on to other things or growing that business itself. So these are sort of, sort of personal perspectives that I have. I think they, they're quite true. They're truisms um, and this this desire for 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 continuing, I think, is this grit is one of the key values um, that I think you need. And that's sort of where my my last slide is. Um, is that because you can't do it alone and, and it is tough, you need success, I really think, comes from the values that you hold and how you approach the opportunity or how you approach what you want to do. And on the left there, we have uh, our six uh, values that we live by and that we try to hire people who have similar values. And that's what's very important, is that if you are working with people um, that have different values to you, you're going to struggle. You need to have very similar values because um, that's what builds cohesiveness within the team. And you need to have a similar, a, a, a same uh, mission. So for us, it's about building better futures. That's our why. So if you're familiar with Simon Sinek's golden circle, the why, how, what, that's our why. Um, it's what drives us. And we've had times in the past where people in, in the in the uh, ventures that we were creating did not share that and it, it didn't really work. And, and we sort of parted ways. So you really need people on your team that have the right values and and share the same mission to be able to make a success of any, of any such venture, especially in medtech, especially in startup, because it is so hard. Um, you know, some of these these values that I've got there on the left are really key. We've tried to codify what we think are the basic sort of things that you need to be able to survive and thrive in an entrepreneurial um, um, context. And you know, things like curiosity. You know, curiosity is key. And if you sort of been listening through the previous uh, case studies, you can sort of see how we had to always inquire, question why, challenge. Um, you know, we had to understand complexity and embrace it. It's, it's uh, People think that they go away from complexity or go away from risk, that's a good thing. Usually where there's complexity and where there's risk, there is opportunity. So that's what you have to go towards, not away from. Um, and I know it's easy to say, and it's sort of a little bit of maybe a euphemism, but it's actually true. It actually manifests itself in different ways in day-to-day 
on the ground. Um, being resourceful, you're always going to have too much to do with too little available. So you have to be able to do what you can with, with what you've got. Um, and that's just um, being clever, focusing on, like we said, the important thing, the big risk. Am I always adding value and not worrying about some of the small stuff uh, and, 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 and dealing with that at another time or when the time comes? And the last key one maybe to po point out, which is very important for me and, and for all of us at IDE, is putting others first. You have to understand the people that you're trying to solve the problems for. You have to understand the people that you're going on the journey with. You have to understand all the people in that in that in that ecosystem to be able to um, to be able to do what is what is best for, for them, which in turn will be the best for for you and your endeavor. So putting other people first, and, um, having empathy, understanding understanding others is really key to understand the problem, which is then leads to providing really valuable solutions and then really valuable business models. Um, yeah, that's probably a good point to end on, uh, James. Richard, that was excellent. Um, we've got four minutes to go. And we've got two important questions, so I'll fire them at you just as quickly as you can. Um, if it's too, you know, complex a topic, then maybe we can take it offline. But hi, Richard. Interesting, you've mentioned that government and NGOs don't tend to provide the right vehicle for sustainability or scale up. As a clinician researcher in health. What tips do you have on my product making the leap out of government auspices? Thanks. Yes, yeah, that's a really good question. I guess it comes down to trying to find um, something that's commercially uh, compelling. Um, trying to sort of see how can you apply what you have to, some, to solving a problem that is commercially attractive to uh, a, another organization or another group of uh, people. I think that's the key. Uh, if you can do that, and if there is something compelling, you will normally find people willing to step in and invest and take it on. So it's a, looking at the business model for what you're doing, because usually when there's not a business model, it's not attractive to the government, and it's, but it's still worthwhile. The government may need to step in, but uh, or an NGO may step in. But if you can produce some value for another entity or another organization in terms of a commercial return, usually that that will help. Um, attract those types of organization and then get 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 you into that sort of more commercial um, um, sort of part of the industry. Um, I, I think this is some things that, that I think people that realize that it's important for a commercial successful. If we, if we want to provide the benefits to uh, the patients, which is very important for me, it has to be commercially viable so it can be scaled so I can bring more benefit to more people. And so if I can find that uh, that commercial uh, value proposition that that's attractive then i get to achieve that end goal um through that through that through that process excellent thank you richard um i see you've got your slide deck up there with uh your contact is that right in your yep. australian netherlands and u.s offices yeah so if, if anyone's got any questions i think one of the questions was um you know who do we speak to if you want to reach out you can reach out at contact at idgroup.com.au or just go on to www.idgroup.com.au and um, we'll get that and uh, we can help we can you know i'm happy i'm happy and they can send it to me if you if you just say that you were at this uh webinar um they will, my, my, my colleagues will forward it to me and i'm happy to just have a chat a talk um for us it's very important it's very passionate for us and that's why we do this is to support the ecosystem here because we want to see more of you succeed and translate because we love that we love building better futures that's what we uh, gives meaning to our lives um, and so we want to help doing that as well. So, so yeah, please feel free to reach out. Excellent. Thank you, Richard. All right, so I'll just uh, quickly sign off. There's a few things to update um, our attendees on uh, before we go. So just ending, me, just ending my screen live now. So this relates to this um, last question that I didn't address, but it's about how to find out more information. So um, for everyone listening, I guess firstly, all of these webinars in this series um, will be posted on uh, the Hub YouTube channel and linked to on our Hub website. So anything Richard said today that you'd like to hear again, um, please visit the website um, and you'll be able to watch um, the webinar back uh, furthermore, any of your colleagues who couldn't come today, but uh, you know you think they benefit from this, please um, word of mouth spread these webinars around. Um, not not just Richard's excellent one today, but also um, the the first three webinars that we've done in this series. This leads me to this next slide. I'll quickly just let you know that um, a, a new hub initiative that will be we will be soon rolling out. Um, 
called uh, the Westmead Entrepreneurship and Research Innovation Network. So this is essentially a, a club for Westmead, a, a society, a community of people who are interested in, um, you know, entrepreneurship, innovation, that um, these kinds of things, you know, do, maybe you have an invention or an idea that could become the next big startup or healthcare solution. Maybe you're interested to learn more about the ecosystem that's needed to take research findings from the lab to the clinic to help patients. Maybe you're interested in understanding what careers are available following your academic journey. Um, if, if that speaks to you, please get in touch with my colleague David Cardoso, um, just dcardoso at cmri.org.au. We'll take your details and as um, plans for our, um, our network firm up, we'll be able to send you resources, things like um, seminars, webinars, training opportunities, um, workshops, uh, excursions to pharmaceutical companies or med tech companies um, and kind of these these are uh, these opportunities that will help you um, upskill and, uh, and and learn more about what it takes to um, go on a journey perhaps like Richard has um, and I'm sure that you know in, in Westmead one of the biggest health and medical research precincts in the southern hemisphere that we have a lot of unearthed ideas uh, you know ready to be teased out and commercialized and um, you know could be the next Potomo Diagnostics. Um, so uh, thank you again. Uh, before we leave I just like to drill the message home that anyone who thinks they've got a novel idea um, you know something that could have uh, you know be, there could be some intellectual property or some you know future commercial value please the first thing you do is call your uh, commercialization staff. Um, so, you know, this slide will tell you briefly who they are, or if you go to the Hub website, you'll be able to find their details. Give them a call and they will guide you on the path um, to, to protect your idea um, and go on that commercialization journey. And lastly, our next webinar will be held on the 29th of September. The title will be, What Does an Investor Look For? How to Prepare Your Latest Discovery for commercial investment. So um, you can find more details about how to get uh, access to that webinar in September on the Hub website. Um, please do. Once again, thank you so much, Richard. That was uh, fascinating. And um, yeah, we really thank you for coming along. And thanks for everyone for signing on to the webinar today.